acres of Clipper Crab clothes for men, and 924 leading retail stores from coast to coast present the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. Our stories are based upon the character of Sherlock Holmes, created by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Sherlock Holmes is portrayed by John Stanley, Dr. Watson by Alfred Shirley, and the dramatizations are by Edith Miser. Once again, we find ourselves in front of Dr. Watson's crackling fire. Uh, just a moment, Mr. Harris, just a moment. Shall I put on a, a fresh pan knot so our listeners can really hear it? Yeah, that's the ticket. Now, uh, go ahead, Mr. Harris. Outside, a cold white autumn mist shrouds the black tree skeletons. But inside, we sit warm and cozy and ready for another of Dr. Watson's fabulous Sherlock Holmes adventures. What's it to be tonight, sir? Uh, your conversation of white shrouds and skeletons brings to mind one of the most bizarre problems we ever undertook to solve. It came dash close to being our final problem, as a matter of fact. <laughs> Sounds promising, Doctor. Nothing I like better than hearing about Holmes in a tight spot. And whenever our adversary proved to be the notorious Professor Moriarty, it was generally a very tight spot. Professor Moriarty? Wasn't he the man Holmes referred to as the Napoleon of crime? The same. Actually, this case began when Sir George Westbrook discovered a corpse dressed in a Roman senator's toga, tunic, and sandals. Holmes always maintained he could deduce a man's entire history from his wardrobe. But uh, this <clears> time... He... <throat> Doctor... Speaking of judging people by their clothes, I oh, thought I... Bless my soul. Yes, of course. I almost forgot. Let's have a few words from our sponsor, who is also an authority on the subject of gentlemen's apparel. Uh, may I say, Dr. Watson, that most people, like Mr. Holmes, do judge people by their appearance. That's mighty important in connection with Clippercraft clothes. Because you'd never guess Clippercraft costs so little. Such low prices for such truly fine quality are rare, to say the least. Clippercraft suits are yours for only $35 and $40, with a few special numbers at $43.75. Top coats and overcoats are only $30 to $40, and sport jackets $24. These are planned values, the result of the Clipper Craft plan concentrating the buying power of 924 leading stores across the country, resulting in tremendous savings in manufacturing and distribution costs. Remember, all this is yours in your own local independent store where friendly attention is traditionally yours. Want to convince yourself? It's as easy as a visit to your Clippercraft dealers. Just compare Clippercraft with clothes selling for many dollars more. And now, Dr. Watson, to get back to the gentleman in the Roman toga. All uh, right, Mr. Harris, but it all began on a freezing winter morning. My first view of Baker Street presented a dispiriting glimpse of icy sleet falling between the dun-colored houses. I donned my carpet slippers, my oldest trousers, and a well-worn bathrobe with the firm intent of enjoying a placid breakfast and settling myself in front of the fire for the rest of the day. I no sooner opened our sitting room door, however, when I caught sight of Holmes tramping about wearing to himself and tossing a shiny golden coin into the air. Confounded if I could only lay hands on the villain. Uh, morning, Holmes. What seems to be the difficulty today? Hmm? Difficulty? Moriarty is back in business. Only this morning, Mrs. Hudson received this coin. Here, have a look at it. Hmm, a handsome gold sovereign. Flooding the town with them. Great Scott, don't tell me Professor Moriarty, the greatest criminal in Europe, has turned philanthropist. No such luck. That coin, Watson, is counterfeit. A brilliant job, more's the pity. Only an expert can spot it. No wonder Moriarty's been so quiet these last two months. It takes time to develop a coin as perfect as this. Well, at least he hasn't had time for murder, arson, or any more of his serious crimes. Serious? You think flooding the country with counterfeit coins isn't serious, Watson? Do you realize what this will do to the value of the pound? Oh, by Jove, of course. I... Hey, Holmes, that's our doorbell. Tell Mrs. Hudson I'm not at home. But Holmes... I'm not accepting any tuppenny halfpenny cases. Not while Moriarty is threatening the credit of the Empire with his fraudulent gold pieces. Oh, well, come in, come in. Uh, I, uh... Which of you gentlemen is Sherlock Holmes? 
Well, my friend over there has the honour. Whatever it is, I'm busy. Oh, but this is terribly, terribly important, so I... I don't know what to do. He, he's dead, you see. Dead men do not interest me. Uh, couldn't you uh, inform his relatives? Well, that's just it. I don't know who they are. I, I, I don't even know who he is. I, I don't even know when he died. Albert, he's my assistant, says it must have been over a thousand years ago, but that seems quite impossible. There's not the slightest sign of decomposition. Oh? On the other hand, and until Albert and I broke through this morning, no one had been in that room for centuries. Uh, what room? Uh, the Roman baths. I, I discovered them, you know. The Brits are undoubtedly ancient Roman. Even the cadaver was clad in a senator's toga. And, and genuine, I assure you. We found him there in one corner. Now, let's get this straight. You found a fresh corpse dressed in a Roman toga in some Roman ruins that have been buried for centuries. Yes, Mr. Holmes. Watson, what are you waiting for? Bring the gentleman a chair. But uh, you said you were busy. Don't be irrelevant. This sounds interesting. Oh, uh, very well. But, uh, won't you uh, sit here, Mr. Uh, oh, Mr. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm... I'm afraid I forgot to introduce myself. Here, here. Here's my card. Read it for me, Watson. Sir George Westbrook, President L and W A Association. That means London and Wessex Archaeological Association. Of course, of course. I remember hearing the Corporation of London had engaged you to investigate some ancient Roman remains which you discovered in the Billingsgate section. That's right, Mr. Holmes. They're under the basement of the Coal Exchange in Lower Thames Street. Albert and I have been burrowing away down there for over a month. This morning, we broke through the final bit of brickwork and emerged into a large subterranean chamber. All right, Albert. I think the opening's big enough. Yeah, give me the lantern. I'll go through first. Yes, sir. Why, Sir George, your hand is shaking. <laughs> Is it any wonder? <laughs> I'm excited, Albert. Unless I'm very much mistaken, we've unearthed some baths that were built by the early Romans. <laughs> yes, well, come along. Careful. Don't, don't tear your clothing. I say, sir, it is a biggish room, isn't it? Splendid, Albert, splendid. Look at that ceiling, will you? In almost perfect condition. No, what's that in the corner over there? Hmm? Looks like a heap of white cloth. No, no, the, there's a, a leg sticking out of it. Good Lord, it's a body. We'd best have a look at it, sir. Yes, but be careful. Don't, don't touch it. Don't touch anything. What's that white thing he's got on? Why, it's a toga, Albert. A Roman toga. It's sopping wet, sir. If you ask me, he's been drowned. <laughs> You say drown, Sir George? That's right, Mr. Holmes. No, but that's impossible. There hasn't been any water in those baths for over a thousand years. Interesting. Very interesting. Tell me, Sir George, mm. what was the condition of the air in that chamber when you broke in? Stale? Vitiated? No, Mr. Holmes. It, uh, it was quite fresh. That's curious now that I think of it. Because there was no other entrance to the room except the one we'd come through. The doorway to the rest of the baths was filled by a, a great heap of bricks and rubble. You were unable to identify the corpse. As a matter of fact, we uh, didn't do any further investigating. Albert was quite overcome by the sight of the body. <laughs> I'm afraid he's never been very strong about such things since the time that mummy disintegrated in his arms while we were working on those pre-Hellenic excavations in Crete. Hmm. I sent him home and came straight here to consult you. You mean you left no one behind to guard the body? No, Mr. Holmes. What? Where's my hat? Where's my coat? Watson, don't just stand there. There's no time to lose. I suppose I should have informed the authorities, Mr. Holmes, that the thought of all those stupid Scotland Yard inspectors trampling around in my beautiful ruins like a herd of elephants. I left a couple of dark lanterns burning. Oh, yes, here they are, in this packing case. All right, now, follow me, gentlemen. Why do basements have to be so damp and depressing? Careful there, careful. This is, this is where we started to dig. It's a rather rough tunnel slanting downward. We'll have to bend over, I'm afraid. You're sure that the, this earth won't cave in on us? No, I don't think so, unless, of course, someone should give it a tremendous push of some sort. Ah, it is where we broke through the wall. 
Well, you'll be interested in this, Mr. Holmes. Notice the masonry. Yes. Yes, the bricks are undoubtedly Roman. Let's see, they measure nine and a half inches long by four and a half inches broad and only one and three quarter inches thick. Not unlike those of the Roman bars at Roxeter. Except that there, the tiles are a mere one and a half inches thick and measure 16 inches by 12. Oh, really, Holmes, did we come here to discuss bricks or inspect a body? Never neglect an opportunity to increase your store of knowledge, Watson. Oh, and stuff my brain with a lot of useless tittle-tattle, not me. Here's the hole we made in the wall, Mr. Holmes. It's not very large, I'm afraid. Well... I'll go through first and light the way. Now, gentlemen, if you'll follow me... I'll go next and you can bring up the rear, Watson, with the other lantern. Now then, Watson, alley open. Don't be in such a rush. Here, take the lantern. It's a tight squeeze, you know. I... Hello, I think I'm stuck. If you'll pull his other arm, Sir George. Right. Oh, <laughs> You're glad to get out of that. I told you you should go on a diet, Watson. Oh, just because you're satisfied to look like a walking skeleton, you were... Hello, this is a gloomy-looking spot. More like a tomb than the sort of place one thinks of as an elegant Roman bathing establishment. Yes, it certainly is more like a tomb at present, complete with the remains of the deceased. Although how he was able to insinuate himself into this chamber... Yes, I... quite... A superficial survey of the walls and ceiling certainly shows no signs of any recent entry, except by way of the hole through which we just dragged Watson. Interesting, very interesting. Yes, suppose we view the body we came to investigate. Yes, he's over here, Mr. Holmes, against the south wall. Oh, watch your step. The flooring here is a bit uneven. Here he is, exactly as we found him, lying on his face with one arm stretched over his head. He's a uh, skinny old boy, wasn't he? I say, these robes or whatever it is he's wearing, they are sopping wet. Yes, the poor fellow was undoubtedly drowned. Lungs still full of water. Extremities icy, rigor well advanced. Well, he's been dead six to eight hours, I should say. Holmes, how about it? Not necessarily. The floor he's lying on is extremely cold, also the air. Of course, the really fantastic part of the whole picture is the man's raiment. The tunic and the toga with the wide purple stripe. Even the thong sandals are the authentic garments of an early Roman senator. So I see, so I see. Whoever this person was, he was thoroughly at home among Roman customs and manners. That ring of office on his outstretched hand is undoubtedly authentic. Oh, look here, Holmes. You, you don't actually believe this is a, a genuine Roman senator who got himself drowned in this room and managed somehow to stay in this state of preservation? No, Watson. There are several obvious flaws to that theory. In the first place, although the costume is authentic in line, cut, and drape, the wooden fabric of this toga was woven not on an ancient hand loom, but by a modern machine. Second, the liquid in which the gentleman was drowned would have evaporated in a short time, even in very stale air. And third, this room is neither the frigidarium, which was the cold plunge, nor the caldarium, which was the warm. No, judging by the recessed benches built into the walls, this room was the sudatorium, or what the Romans called the vapor bath. But of course, Mr. Holmes. Why didn't I think of that? But, good Lord, then, then how was he drowned? And why? Uh, suppose we turn the victim over, Sir George. His identity may give us the answer to those questions. Right-o. Easy. By Jove, he, he looks really even more Roman from this side. That nose, those hawk-like features, like some rapacious old Caesar on a Roman coin. Rather accurate and appropriate description, my dear Watson. Yes, this, unless I'm very much mistaken, is Brutus Octavius Bainbridge, the world's greatest numismatologist. You mean the coin expert? But of course... I thought the old fellow looked familiar. Well, I've heard he often wore Roman dress when he was lounging about at home. Oh, so that part of our mystery is a perfectly normal explanation. Don't be too disappointed, Sir George. There are several other little questions to be cleared up, the answers to which may be rather more exciting than you anticipate. Well, what do you mean, Holmes? Well, for one thing, Mr. Bainbridge disappeared very suddenly from his home one night a little over two months ago. About a fortnight later... The British Isles began to be flooded by an extraordinarily clever counterfeit sovereign. By Jove. I pointed out to Scotland Yard that there might possibly be a connection between the two events. You mean Mr. Bainbridge was a, a counterfeit? I mean, as the greatest living authority on coins and coinage, he was undoubtedly kidnapped by a band of unusually daring counterfeiters and forced to assist them in their work. I thought you might possibly come to that conclusion, Mr. Holmes. Great Scott, that voice. Where does it come from? Over a hidden speaking tube of some sort, I imagine. But who is it? Unless I'm very much mistaken, that voice belongs to my arch adversary. 
Greetings, Professor Moriarty. So now you've taken up counterfeiting. Have I destroyed so many of your activities that you're running short of funds? I've warned you repeatedly, Holmes, that you are getting to be a nuisance. Surely you must have realized how dangerous that can be. But, my dear Professor, surely you must realize that danger is the breath of life to me. <laughs> this time, Holmes, you've overreached yourself. On the contrary, Moriarty, it's you who have gone too far. <clears throat> Watson, get Sir George out of here. I'll keep talking to give you a chance to escape. Was it necessary to kill Bainbridge after you'd finished picking his brains? Not necessary, my dear Holmes. But expedient. We drowned him. I wonder if Dr. Watson can guess why. Well, dashed if I can. Why not shot or strangle? I say, what's all this about, Holmes? Get out of here, you idiot. Well, I leave you in danger, I should say not. You see, Dr. Watson, drowning would serve two purposes. It would eliminate Mr. Bainbridge, and it would provide a taste for Mr. Sherlock Holmes. What do you mean? I knew he'd never turn down an invitation involving a corpse in a toga, ostensibly drowned in an ancient Roman bath. Watson, if you have no regard for your own safety, at least have the intelligence to get Sir George out of here. I'm dashed if I understand what's going on here. <laughs> you will, Sir George, you will. Sorry to have to execute you, too. But I'm afraid you signed your own death warrant when you sent for Mr. Sherlock Holmes instead of Scotland Yard. <laughs> I rather thought you would, you know. Ah, well, this is what comes of associating with anyone who is foolish enough to think he can outwit Professor Moriarty. Look here, you old blunderbuss. You needn't think you can bully back Sherlock Holmes or me either. No. Great Scott, what's that? I rather imagine one of the good professor's hirelings has blown up the entrance to Sir George's tunnel. What do you... You mean we're, we're buried alive in this sepulcher? Mm -hmm. Just like Aida and her young man. Isn't it romantic? <laughs> you might try singing yourself to death as they did. Such a waste of time, I always thought. What a pity Mr. Bainbridge won't be able to join you have made such a jolly quartet. <laughs> well, that's tall, eh, Holmes? Looks as though we're entombed in this blasted place until Sir George's assistant turns up tomorrow morning and finds the tunnel caved in. Tomorrow, my dear Watson, is Sunday, and the day after, a bank holiday. Better blow out one of the lanterns and save it for later. But this is terrible, Mr. Holmes. Well, we'll, we'll be asphyxiated by the time Melbourne arrives on Tuesday. I doubt it, Sir George. There's a very definite movement of air. Fresh air. Icy fresh air. If you'll wet a finger and hold it up, you'll notice what amounts to a slight breeze. No, I doubt that we shall die from any lack of oxygen. We may very well perish, however, from cold and exposure. Doesn't take long to freeze to death in this temperature. Oh, you needn't be so confounded cheerful about it, Holmes. Don't interrupt, Watson. As I was saying, we may very well expire unless we can discover how Mr. Bainbridge's body was brought into this room. What good will that do? Any passageway large enough to permit the entrance of this corpse will also serve as an exit for Sir George and myself. You, Watson, may have a bit of trouble. Oh, you go to blazes. But, Mr. Holmes, what passageway could there be? As you know, the architecture of the ancient Roman baths was fairly identical. There was obviously only one doorway into this bath, and that's blocked by a great fall of earth and bricks. Quite. But aren't you forgetting, Sir George, the small, unseen, tube-like passage that invariably ran under all the rooms except the coal plunge? Of course. The hypocost. Now, oh, what in thunder is a hypocost? A smallish tunnel lined with red paving squares, which ran from a furnace outside the buildings under all the principal rooms of a Roman bath. If we can discover some loose tiling in this floor, we may thank the ancient Romans for inventing what our poor, retarded civilization considers a modern improvement, namely central heating. <laughs> Discouraging. I've dug up two dozen spots. Cheer up, Watson. At least the activities kept you from freezing to death. Yes, it's ruined my trousers. Good thing I was wearing my old suit. I say, the light's getting dimmer. 
Holmes, the second letter is about burnt out. Keep digging, Watson. It's our only chance. I say, Mr. Holmes, uh, could you come over here a minute? I think I've found a sort of grating under this last batch of bricks. Good Lord, let's see. Yes. Yes, we found it. Watson, help me with these bricks. Right. Right. Uh, there. Watson, bring the lantern. Right here. Here they are. Now then, let's see. There's a black down there, isn't it? Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Sir George. We are now in the vapor room. The blocked-up entrance over there leads to the hot bar. That would put the cold plunge on our left. No good going in that direction. When we go down into the tunnel, we should turn right to get out. Quite correct, Mr. Holmes. I go first. Give me the lantern, Watson. It's flickering, Holmes. It's, it's gone out. Very well, then. We'll have to crawl our way out in the dark. I've been crawling like a snake for hours. Stop complaining, Watson. At least we're not sealed up in that vault. Well, maybe not, but I can't say this is any great improvement. Oh, I don't ask to stand upright. If I could only get to my hands and knees for a moment. There's a shallow pool of water here. How jolly. I could use a bath, only I'd just as soon not have ice water, you know. Save your breath. How are you getting along, Sir George? I'll, I'll manage. Oh, what? Now what? Something ran over my hand. Probably a sewer rat. Delightful. Maybe we can take it home for a pet. Quiet, Watson. I think we've reached the end of the tunnel. Yes. It opens out. You mean I can finally get up off my stomach? Yes, give your hand. Oh. I think my back is permanently bent. Hello. There are some steps here. Steps going up. And the door at the top. It's open a slit. Yeah. There's a light. Well, there must be another entrance at ground level. Yes. Follow me and be very quiet. Better have your revolver handy, Watson. This may well be the most dangerous part of the entire adventure. Easy now. Let's have a look through the crack before we open the door. It's a large, bare-looking place. Then what's all that machinery? Those are melting furnaces, presses, weighing apparatus, rolling machines. And on the far side of the acid and water baths in which Bainbridge was undoubtedly drowned. In short, you see before you a very complete mint for the coining of counterfeit money. Mr. Holmes, who's that sinister-looking man stepping out of the shadows? There, there, look. He's adjusting a jeweler's magnifying glass in one eye. Now he's... he's hunched over a pile of golden coins. Good Lord. His head oscillates from side to side like a snake. Enjoying the fruits of your labor, Moriarty? You! Holmes! You didn't expect us to return your call quite so promptly, eh, Professor? Don't bother to reach for that acid. Watson has you covered. Better put your hands up. That's right. Now, you'll come around that table. Slowly. That's right. I have a little present for you. A pair of bracelets that... Ah! Holmes, he's going through the window! <laughs> shoot, Watson, shoot, confound it! I can't! Why not? Well, blast it all. You asked me out of the house in such a dither this morning I forgot to slip my revolver into my overcoat pocket. <laughs> Don't look so crestfallen, Watson. I'm rather relieved we didn't get the handcuffs on the professor. Once he's safely behind bars, I'll have no opponent worthy of my talents. I should probably die of sheer boredom. You mean sheer conceit? <laughs> was quite a story, Dr. Watson. There's always plenty of action when Professor Moriarty's around. How true, Mr. Harris, how true. This particular adventure had a rather pleasant epilogue. Uh, what was that, Doctor? Oh, well, suppose I tell you about it after we pay our respects to the gentlemen who so graciously make this program possible. What hmm? could be fairer? You know, the thing you remember about Clippercraft clothes is not their low prices. Not until you're ready to buy again, that is. What you really live with is Clippercraft's superb styling. The perfect fit, fine tailoring, and long-wearing fabrics. No one would dream your Clippercraft suit had cost only thirty-five or forty dollars, or forty-three seventy-five for a few special numbers, or that your top coat or overcoat had cost only thirty to forty dollars, or your sport jacket twenty-four dollars. No, these exceptional values are made possible by the unique Clippercraft plan. 
concentrating the buying power of 924 leading stores across America, bringing these fine clothes to you in a pleasant atmosphere where you get friendly personal attention. Selling beautifully tailored expensive clothes at inexpensive low prices at the nation's finest stores is the great big idea behind the Clippercraft plan. That's why men who know insist on Clippercraft clothes. So be sure to visit the Clippercraft store in your city. The leading stores in the metropolitan area that bring you Clippercraft clothes are Saks 34th, Broadway at 34th Street, Manhattan, Abraham and Strauss, Brooklyn, the Boulevard Men's Shop, Presby, Newark, Newark, New Jersey, and the B&B Clothes Shop, 16408 Jamaica Avenue, Jamaica. These great, courteous, and friendly stores are proud to add their names to that of Clippercraft in the label of your suit, top coat, sports jacket, and overcoat. Now, Dr. Watson, about the epilogue to the adventure of the corpse in the Roman toga. Well, the officers of the Royal Mint tended to Holmes and myself a dinner in recognition of our invaluable services in breaking up a counterfeiting outfit which had threatened the value of British currency. Holmes received a large illuminated scroll and a, a sizable check. Always acceptable, eh, Dr. Watson? <laughs> yes, quite so. I was presented with a priceless Roman ring of office which we had found on the dead man's finger, and a magnificent copy of Vitruvius de Architectura. On the flyleaf in Holmes' handwriting was the inscription, One never knows what bit of useless tittle-tattle may save a man's life. The chapter on the hypocost was underlined. Got you that time. And now, Dr. Watson, I wonder if you'd like to give us a hint about next week's story. Well, next week, I think I'll tell you how Holmes and I found a man shot under a smashed streetlight. All the evidence pointed in one direction, but the victim had been shot at point-blank range, and there was only one wound, but we heard two shots. Oh, Holmes always referred to it as the case of the well-staged murder. The makers of Clipper Craft Clothes and 924 leading stores from coast to coast have brought you another in the new series of broadcasts featuring the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes is produced and directed by Basil Lochran with special music by Albert Berman. If you don't know your Clippercraft dealer... Right Clippercraft, 200 Fifth Avenue, New York City. Hunger and starvation are the enemies of civilization and democracy. It's up to every American, man, woman, and child, to save a little food every day. In that way, the people of Western Europe can be helped in their fight for decency and freedom. listen next week to Sherlock Holmes in the case of the well-staged murder. If you'd like to attend the Sherlock Holmes broadcast in New York, see your local Clipper Craft dealer and he'll tell you how to obtain your tickets. Clipper Craft Code. This is a mutual broadcasting system.